want the lights yeah. like this or down a little? No, this is fine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for being here and thanks to y'all for showing up. Uh, thank goodness it's not five degrees again. And uh, so, you know, that would have been a task. But anyway, uh, we got a lot of things to talk about tonight. And uh, hopefully some of y'all have, how many of y'all have seen the movie that, so far? Oh, that's cool. All righty. And maybe some of the rest of y'all will. If, uh, for those of y'all that have seen the movie, I brought something from the movie, a prop, if you want to come up here and scope it out. It's the, uh, the journal that Jimmy writes in during the movie. So if you saw that, then that's kind of cool. And if you remember uh, the mean science teacher in the movie who yells at Jimmy, then that was, uh, that was me. And so I got to yell at Jimmy and all that. So being in the movie was major fun, but it was very difficult. Uh, so I have a, a super appreciation for actors and all that, even more than I did already. And, uh, but anyway, a couple of questions to start out with. I'm gonna talk about writing some and things like that. We'll talk about the issues uh, in a little bit, but I wanna talk since y'all are in school and I was a teacher, I've always gotta get in my teacher moments. And uh, so how many of y'all would uh, like to be a hero? Okay, a hero. Like a superhero? Well, no, not a superhero, just for somebody to say, hey, you're my hero. Okay, a few hands. A few hands came up. Okay, we'll come back to that question in a little bit. Uh, the next question. How many of y'all, we'll talk about writing some, talk about my writing and stuff. How many of y'all would like to read somebody's mind? Oh, yeah, that always gets everybody excited. Who'd like to read the mind of somebody dead? Well, that would be kind of creepy. <clears throat> okay, I'm sure you have some people in mind, uh, the, you know, the, the living. So how many of y'all have uh, read a book, watched a movie, watched a TV show, read a comic book? Well, let's just take some care of, you know, everybody, <clears throat> for sure. So let's think of some of your favorite characters. I'm sure you have your own, I have mine, whether it's Atticus Finch or whether it's Huck Finn or, uh, you know, some of the other characters you'd like, Iron Man or Darth Vader or whatever, whatever it might be, you know. Was, have those characters always existed? Romeo and Juliet, has Romeo and Juliet, were they always characters? No. There was a day in which Romeo and Juliet did not exist. And then the next day, they did. Because somebody named William Shakespeare said, you know what, I think I'm gonna come up with a story about these two kids who are uh, in different families that fight against each other. They don't get along, but these two kids fall in love. What kind of stress would that put on their life and in the family's lives? And I'm gonna write a story called Romeo and Juliet. And it's not a story that he thought up. I'm sure it did the same thing had come up many years before and centuries before that. But there was a time in which Romeo did not exist. And then Shakespeare looks at his parchment paper or whatever, takes out his pen, and he starts to write. And from that moment when he named them, they existed and they'll exist forever. So whether it's a TV show, whether it's a book, whatever it might be, there was a time in which that did not exist. And where did it come from? The Jimmy, if you end up reading the book, Jimmy Winterpock or Harry Potter or whatever it was, whoever it might be. Um, where did those characters come from? They came from somebody's mind. And it's okay if you jump in there. They came from somebody's mind, right? Somebody had to think them up, all right? And then they say, you know what? I'm gonna take this kid, I'm gonna put him in this situation and I'm gonna have him, I'm gonna give him some friends and then we're gonna let him run off and do things. And I know what, I'll call him Jerry Potter. Wait, that doesn't sound good. I'll call him Larry. No, wait a minute. What about Harry Potter? And I'm gonna give him uh, glasses that are square. No, wait, I'm gonna give him glasses that are round. And I'm gonna give him three friends that they, wait, you know what? How about a guy and a girl? And I'm gonna put them in situations where the most important thing in their life is their friendship. And I'm gonna put them on adventures and see how it works out, right? And then they exist forever. But there was a time in which J.K. Rowling was struggling with where that story was going, and she was like, wow, I don't have any transition between these paragraphs, and I'm not really sure about this, what happens here, and I don't like this word, and they go back over it, and they revise, and they revise, and they revise, and the version that you get to read, or that you get to see on the big screen, or that you get to read in a comic book, or whatever it might be, <clears throat> that's the 20th version, or the 50th version of that story. But there's a moment in which that writer 
whether there's somebody that's alive now or somebody that's been dead for hundreds of years, there was a moment in which they read it all the way through themselves. And they were like, I love it. I'm going to put it out there for the world to read. And then you come along, whether it's a year later, whether it's hundreds of years of later, hundreds, hundreds of years later, and you read it. And you at that moment, when you read it for the first time, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is great. It's just like that last moment that the writer read it themselves and said, oh my gosh, this is great. You're looking over the shoulder of any writer that you could ever think of. You're reading their mind. <clears throat> and so it was always up here. And so always remember that. You really are connected to all these people that have created things through the centuries. And whether it's in middle school or when you go to high school and college and you get to interact with all these wonderful pieces of literature and wonderful movies and things like that, you can always, always remember that. You're reading their thoughts. So you are reading their mind. Uh, something else about reading, I mean about writing, um, or anything creative. If you want any emotion to come out of something, and I hope when you read the book or watch the movie, it'll create some emotion in you, and there's things that do, other stories. You can't have emotion come out of anything if you as the writer or the person that creates it don't put it in. And so there's parts in the movie that are sad to me that people will write us and say, oh my gosh, that scene made me cry. The, this part of the book really bothered me a lot. Or this was very funny. Any emotion that you experience, the writer was going through that. You have to as a writer. And so that's one of the things that makes it good. And when I was writing something, when I was writing some of the scenes in, in the book and in the movie, I drew on my own life. And I remember the emotions that I felt when I was being picked on. And when Jimmy writes in his journal about a bad day he has, and he says when mom, he's writing in his journal, and there's a part where he folds it, and he says the teacher not to read it, and he says at the end of it, he says, when mom came in to say goodnight, I had to pretend I was asleep so she wouldn't see me crying. And so I remember that. I remember having a bad day when I was in eighth grade, and it was, it was awful. And so I drew upon that. <clears throat> there was also a time when I was in high school, and one of the reasons that I, I like to speak to groups is because I want to share some things that I hope you don't do. And when I was a junior and senior in high school, there was this kid, his name was Paul, and me and all my buddies, we would hang out at lunchtime down by the steps that went from the gym down to the parking lot. And uh, Paul would try to come out there and join in the group, and this one kid named Donald would stand there, and, and Paul had some issues, and Donald would see him and he would go, hey, Paul, guess what? My mom fixed me <clears throat> uh, mayonnaise and pickles for a sandwich. What do you think of that? And Paul would just, it would just drive him nuts. He's like, you can't, you shouldn't mix those. And he would get himself all worked up and Donald would just laugh and laugh and he would look over at us and he would laugh some more and he would keep picking on Paul and finally Paul would get himself so worked up that he would grab his book bag and he would run back to the gym and back inside the school and sit by himself. And guess what I did? And guess what my buddies did about that? We did nothing. I stood there and I watched. I stood there and I watched. And I, to this day, have that memory and it haunts me. Out of all the good things that I have in my high school memory bank, those days are just as vivid as any day that was wonderful. And when we go to high school reunions and you hang out with your buddies and all that kind of stuff and it's like, yeah, you remember that game and this game and this teacher and, and all that? Guess who's not there? Paul ain't there. He doesn't want to look at us. Why would he want to show up and look at us and say, oh, I remember what you did. I remember what you didn't do. And so things like that show up when you start to write. And I, and, and I taught for 31 years, and I retired about five or six years ago, and everybody thinks that I taught literature. I taught math. I taught trig and calculus and all that stuff, and I coached the basketball team. And if you'd asked me 15, 16 years ago, what would you be doing on this day? I never would have guessed this, but I'll say this much. Writing has changed my life so much for the better. And even if you just journal, I would encourage you to write because it puts you in touch with things about yourself that you never thought you might want to deal with. And so even if you just journal for your own self, 
and nobody ever reads it. I would encourage you to do it because it'll, it'll help you. It really does. It has helped me in, in so many ways. Um, so that's my writing. Let's talk about your writing for a minute. How many of y'all uh, have to turn in essays for your English class? Hopefully that's everybody. All right. <clears throat> now, how many times have you gotten a paper back from your teacher and there's marks on it? And she says, oh my gosh, you might want to work on this a little bit, all right? And then y'all get that look of like, are you kidding me? Isn't this, aren't these the best two paragraphs that have ever been written in the history of middle school language arts? You're asking me to change them? They're already perfect, all right? Well, the chances are they're not, okay? We worked on the Fat Boy Chronicles book. It took us nine months to write it, about a year to edit everything that we have worked on, when I say we, I mean Diane Lang, my co-author, she lives in Cincinnati, and uh, everything we have worked on editing much more than we did the writing and the creating part. We just finished a book that we have been working on, I can't believe this, for eight years, all right? So when you have to go back and revise your paper for 15 minutes, I don't want to hear about it, okay? So, now, on that editing stuff, um, if you were to pick up the Fat Boy Chronicles book or any book and you started reading and it was kind of like a jumbled mess and you're like, well, I don't understand these characters and I don't get this and, and these, all these sentences are the same length and he starts every sentence with he, she, or the and it's all the same words and it's just like, it's kind of boring. Would you keep reading? No. You wouldn't keep reading any book. You would do, well, I met that guy, you know, and I'll read the book even though I really don't like it. All right? You wouldn't keep reading. You're going to judge me. You're going to think that's the best he can do. All right? That's the best he can do because he's had time to fix it. And so when you turn in your paper and you're content with it being mediocre, eventually people are going to think that you're capable only of mediocre. All right? They're going to start judging you by what you do. That's kind of the way the world works. All right? When I coach the basketball team, if mom came up to me or dad and said, oh my gosh, Billy is so good. He just kills his sister in the driveway, right? He never misses a shot from the shrubbery or whatever it might be. He's got so much potential. And I go, okay, great. And then you have tryouts. And number one, Billy shows up late and he can't, all he wants to do is shoot threes and he doesn't want to play any defense and he can't really make a layup. But he's got potential. Is he going to be on the team? Is he, gang? No, he's not going to be on the team, right? Potential meant nothing. What did you do? What did you produce? Right? If you wanted to make an A in my trig class, you better bring your A game. There's nothing you can say that will make you get an A other than what you produce. And so in everything, when you turn in that paper to your English teacher or to whatever class it might be and you go, this has my name on it. It's got my name, me, the only one in the universe that will ever exist. That's my best work. And your teacher and you know it's not. Is that okay? Not really. So when your teacher says, hey, I think you might want to work on this, you go, thanks. Thank you. I will. And if you work on it again and you make it better and you change one word and you, and you change one sentence and you make them not all the same length, and you make it so that it's interesting and it has some, what was that stuff we talked about putting in your stories a minute ago? Some emotion. So your teacher doesn't have to read 30 papers that are all the same. Make yours better, make yours different. And over time, that making it different and making it better becomes a habit. And everything you do will be that, okay? So, one of the things we learn in, uh, you learn about screenwriting is that action equals character. So everything that you see in a movie, whatever a character does is who they are, right? They can say all kind of stuff. So always remember that what you do is who you are. You have the choice to do things to make your life better, to make other people's lives better. That choice that you make to do something, that defines you as much as anything that you could ever say you're going to do, all right? So, one of the things that I do is I go around and I talk about 
the book, the movie, and the issues, and all those kind of things. The two issues that confront the main character, Jimmy, are uh, bullying and obesity. He's the overweight kid, not by much, and he gets picked on, all right? And it's not pleasant at times, and he tries to make life better, and sometimes it just can't because you can't really control the people around you all the time. And, uh, but you can always control uh, yourself, right? So he kind of does that, and he takes some ownership of it. In the same way that if you want to take, if you want to make the basketball team, you want to make an A, it's really nobody's problem but who? Yours. You're the only one that can make that happen. You are the only one that can make that happen. So even in the bullying problem and in the obesity problem, whatever it might be, you have to take some ownership of this too, okay? You cannot wait for adults to do everything for you. You have to decide what it is you want better in your life and what it is you want to happen. And you have to make that happen, and you can. I've seen it too much as a teacher, I've seen it too much as traveling around, that you, as a middle school kid, can make your life better and you can make the lives of those around you better and you have to do that. So it's all about taking ownership. And the thing is, like I said a minute ago, uh, eventually you're gonna be an adult. It's on the way, guaranteed, all right? And the behaviors that you uh, practice now, they become part of you. And that makes it better for you and it makes it better for everybody. Um, so about six years ago, Diane and I were at a book signing for another book that would probably be more appropriate for your moms. And this kid walked up, and we were outside of Cincinnati, and this kid walks up and he says, <coughs> uh, y'all are writers? And we're like, uh, yeah. And he said, and y'all were teachers? And we're like, uh-huh. And he said, well, you need to tell my story. And we're like, okay. And we get that a lot, you know, every time we go somewhere, which is, which is great, I love hearing stories, but everybody's got an uncle that's kind of crazy, and everybody's got a family or somebody in the family like you wouldn't believe Bertha's life oh my gosh it needs to be a movie and so people are always telling us tales and sometimes some of those stories kind of end up in other stories where we're like you know that is good and so you kind of you kind of borrow it a little bit but this kid was slim and trim and he and we said well what's your story and he said well, my name's Doug and he said uh my uh He said, I'm in the, he said, I'm in the 10th grade now. And he said, but all during my elementary and middle school days, life was very difficult. And he said it was, he got tortured. The bullies were just awful to him because he was a little bit overweight. And, uh, and he said, the thing was, the only time anybody really wanted to talk to him was when they wanted to dog him out. He said he would sit by himself on the bus he would sit by himself at lunch. He would get dressed by himself in the locker room. The only time somebody would talk to him in class was if the teacher called on him or somebody was like making some remark that was not nice. And uh, and he said it was just awful. And he said, and then he paused, and I'll never forget this. And he said, but you know, sometimes it was okay if they picked on me. And I'm like, really, Doug, why would that be okay? And he said, because at least I know they saw me. And he said he would feel invisible in a school of 1,200. And I was like, wow, that's not the way school should be. And so we looked at him, we said, but you're slim and trim. What, what, what's the difference? And he said, well, it's eighth grade spring. And now here's the thing, one thing that, you know, a lesson learned from Doug. He never talked to his parents. He was really good at hiding it, and I've taught long enough to know that students can look you right in the face and go, everything's fine. And they'll do that to parents, and they'll do that to everybody that's an adult, all right? And when things are not fine, and sometimes if you're the friend of that person, you have to be the one to step up and say, you know what, maybe he's not telling you, but I'll tell you for him or for her because things aren't fine in their life and maybe we can all make it better for them because they're my friend or they're my classmate that I don't even know, but they're, they're a person and they deserve respect, all right? And so anyway, so Doug said that he had never told his parents and he didn't tell his teacher and he didn't tell his counselor or his coach. And he said, finally, he went to the doctor and the doctor, for whatever reason, was just kind of talking to him about school and it just came out. And out it came and it just spilled out and Doug just told the doctor. And the doctor said, you know what, Doug? 
You can't control these other people. Like we said earlier, the doctor said, there's only one person in your life you'll ever really be able to control, and that's yourself. Why don't you do something for you? It might not make the bullying go away, but do something for you. And so this kid, his eighth grade summer, had enough strength to get up before the sun came up and start walking around the block. And then he walked around the block twice. And then he jogged around the block. And then he could jog around the block several times. And his dad caught on. And he finally did tell his dad. And him and his dad started working out some. And when he walked into the doors of ninth grade, he had lost 45 pounds. And he hasn't gained a lick of it back. Right? And he just got married. And he graduated with honors from graduate, uh, with a uh, grad, uh, grad degree in chemical engineering from the University of Cincinnati. And he works for Procter & Gamble. And life was pretty good for Doug. But there were times which it wasn't, and he could have easily been one of those kids that falls through the cracks, and he never quite picks himself up, okay? But life is okay for Doug now, but it wasn't at one time. And so, um, let me show you something from Doug. This is an interview we did with him before the book and the movie and all that stuff was coming out.
when we did that interview uh, there at UC, you know, Doug wanted to talk about now, and you know, I've got a, you know, I've got a girlfriend. And, oh, speaking of girlfriend, he had he struggled so much with his self esteem from all the years of being picked on. It wasn't until he was in college that he had the courage to ask a girl out. And so when he told us then, he's like, hey, I've got a girlfriend. He was beyond jazz, all right? And he wanted to talk about how things are working out now. And, and here I'm in school, and I'm studying this and that. And, and we said, well, you know what, Doug? For this to really be meaningful, we've got to know the way it was. And he's like, ah, you know, can't we just talk about how good things are now? And we're like, let's just talk about it for a minute. And when he went back and started talking <clears throat> about his middle school days, it was very difficult for all of us. And by the time the interview was over, all of us were crying. And, uh, and he just, it was, it was not nice for him to have to remember that. And one of the things that I guarantee you, regardless of how wonderful Doug's life works out, he will never forget those days of middle school. He will never forget how people treated him, what they said or what they didn't say. Now, when he's talking about that, what, um, how did he talk about how he was picked on? Did he say that people shoved him? Did they throw rocks at him? Anything like that? What was it? What was it that was so harmful? Huh? Yes? Words, that's right. Words. Words? Really? The words did that to him? Or lack thereof? Are words powerful, important? Can words do things to people like that? Well, let me read a few words. How many of y'all have ever been to Washington, D.C.? All right, a good many of you. And the rest of y'all will end up there one day. You'll go, and it's cool, and I've been there a few times. And when they got the neatest stuff, I mean, they got all these buildings, and they got the museums, and you can look at this, and you can look at these rocks, and diamonds, and airplanes, and moon things, and whatever it might be, just all kind of stuff, and mammoths, and you just walk around and go, wow, look at that, that is like so cool. But, that doesn't inspire me. You know what inspires me when I get there? It kind of makes a tear come up a little bit, is when I walk through the Jefferson Memorial and read the words on the wall. When I walk through the, the Roosevelt Memorial and I read the words that he said to a nation that was struggling with depression and war. When I go down to the Vietnam Wall and you run your hand across a name, right? <clears throat> and then you go to the Lincoln Memorial and you read the words that say four score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And then you turn around from right there in Lincoln's front of the Lincoln statue and you walk out and you take about a dozen steps and you look down and there's a plaque. I mean, a little marker on the, cement, on the uh, marble steps. The Georgia marble steps, I might add. And you know what it says right there? It says, on this spot, Martin Luther King Jr., gave his I have a dream speech that said I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Just words. But what did those words do? Some of those, we had words that formed our nation, we had words that healed our nation, and we've had words that helped our nation find its soul. All right. And if words can change history, they can certainly change a person. So when you think something that you might say to somebody is cute and funny and they'll get over it, they do not. Those words have power. Those words have power. And when you let somebody say things to somebody else, you're giving that power to them to say those words. Always remember that words are so powerful. All right? But words alone do nothing. What do words have to, what are all of those words followed by that changed our nation, that changed people? They're followed by action. Words alone don't do much of anything, but you've got to follow them by action. So when you say, I'm going to make the basketball team, 
it means you've got to put that into action. When you say, I'm going to do better in school, it means uh, you've got to put that into action. I will take out the trash on Thursdays. You've got to put that into action. I will do something about the kid in my school who's getting picked on, about the kid who sits by himself on the bus, the kid who sits by himself at lunch. I will go sit with them. I will go talk to them. I will talk to a teacher and tell them, hey, you know what? Maybe Billy can't come up here and speak for himself, but I can speak for Billy. Actions are what matter. Action is character. What you do is who you are. Okay? Let me show you some other things here. If we can... What happened? Look at all these happy faces. They look like school pictures. Not all of them, some of them. The kid on the bottom left, he was the one that uh, kind of inspired a website that I got some of these from. And, uh, you know, that's probably his, you know, fourth grade picture. That's not, you know, the last picture ever taken of him. The girl in the middle, that was her high school picture. And the kid right there, it's kind of hard to see it in the, in the middle left. That was his senior picture. He's got his little robe on. I guess his school colors were blue and gold, perhaps. Kind of like the school I used to teach at. And uh, all these kids look so happy. All right? And, uh, well, let me tell you the story of the, of the girl in the, in the middle. Her name was Phoebe. Her name is Phoebe. And uh, she had moved over here from, from Ireland to the northeast. And she was kind of cute, and the guys were checking her out, and so the girls got jealous, right? And they started dogging her out on Facebook. And then they started saying things to her in the hallway, and then they started, you know, actually kind of throwing things at her when she got off the bus and stuff like that. And, uh, and she told her mom, and she didn't quite understand it. You know, she, when the school she came from, everybody was kind of nice to each other. And she didn't quite understand why it was happening. And, and her mom said, well, I'll go to the school and talk to them. And she went there, and she talked, and and they said, well, you know, we'll talk to the kids. We'll try to make it better, and we'll work on it. And then Phoebe went back to school, and, of course, things got worse, right? Because the school really didn't do much, and nobody really stood up for Phoebe, even though she had some friends, and people knew what was going on, but nobody said anything, right? And uh, now, Phoebe had a little sister who was about your age, all right? And... Her little sister came home one day from school and found Phoebe hanging in the closet where she had killed herself, right? Now, if you had the chance to do something about that, whether you knew her or not, wouldn't you? Yeah. But you know what, it, well, you know what her friends did and her classmates and her acquaintances? Oh my gosh, then they went to the teachers and they said, oh my gosh, you won't believe how they treated Phoebe. And they went to the counselors because they needed grief counseling and they said, oh my gosh, you won't believe how what they did and what they said on Facebook. And then they had to talk to the police and they talked to their moms and dads at home and, it, and, and everybody just wanted to talk like crazy about Phoebe and her issues. And then they all got together and they got in their cars and they went to her funeral. Because what did all that talking do then? Nothing. Right? Nothing. When they had the chance to speak, they didn't. The kid on the middle left, his name was Eric. The bully in class, who had been picking on Eric all year long, and nobody had ever said anything, leaned over to Eric one day in class, because everybody said this later. Oh, guess what the guy said to Eric? He said, hey, Eric, why don't you go home and shoot yourself? Nobody's going to miss you. And that's what he did. And people had the chance to say something, and people had the chance to do something, and people had the chance... To make life better for these kids who maybe struggled so much with all the bullying that they, they just didn't know how to go to an adult. They didn't know how to make their life better. It became the responsibility of those people around them who weren't being bullied but saw it. 
So much of bullying takes place outside the view of an adult. 85% of bullying is never within the sight of an adult. So guess who sees it? You. Guess who has to do something about it? You. Right? Your teachers can help. Your parents can help. They can do everything that they can possibly do. But it's got to be your problem to solve as much as anybody's. Right? I can't imagine what Phoebe's little sister will remember for the rest of her life. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody had spoken up and that never happened and that memory is never in that little girl's mind and in the mind of the mom and in the mind of her friend? You've got a chance. You cannot do anything about what has happened up to this very moment. It's all history. It's your history. All right? But you can do something about tomorrow and the next day. You can actually go up to somebody and say, you know what, you want to sit with me? You can go up to an adult and say, you know what, I want to tell you what's going on. You can, you far outnumber the bullies. You can go up to them and say, don't do that. Because you're going to have to come talk to me next. Don't do that. You have the power. In every school that I visit around the nation, there's a few bullies. There's some victims. Guess who's the biggest group of all? Who are the three groups? There's the bullies, there's the victims, and there's the bystanders. You outnumber them by 20 times. There's so many of you. Don't be the kid that I was in the 11th grade and stood there and watched Paul get picked on. All right? You can make a difference. You can leave a legacy. It's great if you work on the dance and you help with this and you do that and all that. But let me tell you what. If somebody can come up to you in 20 years from now and say, you know what, I want to thank you for what you did for me. I want to thank you for that club you started. I want to thank you for coming over and sitting with me at lunch. I want to thank you for something because it didn't mean hardly anything to you, but oh goodness, did it mean the world to me. Because finally somebody saw me. I wasn't invisible anymore. Right? Isn't that what we want to do to help those that need it the most? It's always easy to be there for the kid who's got everything going on and the quarterback and everybody just loves him. You've got to be there for that other kid. That's a true test of who you are. Okay? So while I go, well, let me tell you a story and you tell me what you think. I was visiting the school. And uh, I was walking down to the auditorium, kind of like this, and there was a water fountain out in the hall. And all the kids are going down the hall and everything. And uh, I guess there was some water by the water fountain. And this kid slipped and fell and I heard his crack. And I looked over and he had his skin was poking out like this. And I guess he had broken his arm, right? And, uh, and I, you know, all the kids just kept going to the auditorium and he's laying there kind of in pain. And, and I looked over and I was like, wow, I don't know. Uh, that's awful. But I don't, I don't know him. I mean, I didn't teach there. You know, I had to go do my talk. And so I, I kept going. Was that okay? Who thinks that was okay? Who thinks that's not okay? All righty. So what you're saying to me is, I should go over and help some kid who's got a broken arm, a kid that I don't know, and you can walk by in the hallway every day, a kid who's got a broken heart because of how somebody treats him. I guarantee you that kid with a broken arm, his scars will heal. I've heard it told to me too many times from people that are 15 to 75 that those other scars, the ones you put on somebody's heart, never go away. Now, the broken arm story I made up, but it sure gets a point, doesn't it? You were kind of mad at me, weren't you? Yes. You were like, oh my gosh, how can he be standing here telling me this stuff? And then he does that. I wouldn't do that. Don't you? You know that's wrong. So you also know that it's wrong to sit there and let somebody be picked on. All right? So you got to do something about it. Um, I asked you earlier, who would like to be a hero? Now, heroes... I kind of think from watching TV and movies are soldiers and policemen and 
firemen and uh, teachers, right? And moms and dads. They're heroes. Well, what is a hero anyway? Who thinks you know? What does a hero do? If you say a hero, what? They help others and they maybe save lives, right? Yes? They look up to them. That's right. Oh, that's a good point because I want to come back to that. A hero is somebody that helps others, saves lives, people look up to them. Especially that save lives part, right? Wouldn't it have been nice if Phoebe had had a hero? Wouldn't it have been nice if Eric and all those other kids on there, the one in the top right was from Atlanta, he was 11. Wouldn't it have been nice if all those kids and the hundreds of others that we could have put on the screen, wouldn't it have been nice if they had had a hero, if somebody had said, hey, I'm here to help you, right? And guess what? There's nothing in the dictionary that says heroes only are 18 years and older. Heroes can be middle school kids, all right? There's something that you could do for somebody that could save their life. That would be really cool. Who wants to be a hero? Okay, good. That's a few more hands than we saw earlier. So, in closing, I think we're going to do some Q&A about things and want to, uh, you know, any of the parents that have questions and stuff like that. But for the most part, I really want to thank you for listening. Y'all have been a great audience, and I hope some of this sinks in and you can make a difference in someone else's life, which will make a difference in yours. Thank you very much. So does anybody have any questions about the book, the movie, stuff that I didn't uh, address? One thing I did want to speak, and the fellow over here talked about, somebody that uh, gets looked up to, is the power of athletes in a school, in high school especially. If somebody walked in and knew, would they rather sit with the chess captain or the captain of the football team? Well, some of y'all may be the chess captain, but in general, the athletes are revered in a school, right? And so for those of y'all that are athletes, you have so much potential to change the atmosphere of your school. Uh, one, some of the schools that we visit around the nation have mentoring programs. I'll toss this out. It's on the handout back there about what you can do in your school. And to be, in, to be a kid on the varsity team, whatever varsity team that might be, you have to agree to be a mentor of somebody else coming into the school. Right? Not a kid on the, on the uh, not another athlete, but another kid. And it helps immensely. For, for that one kid to have somebody in the school that they can speak with and that they can kind of go, hey, let me talk to you for a minute. And so and it gives the athletes an understanding of, wow, I can really make a difference. So never forget that, right? If you end up being in a leadership position, which being an athlete is, people look up to you and you can make a difference for them. All right, any other questions about anything? There's got to be something. When you watch the movie, I'll tell you a couple of cool things. Uh, the, uh, there's a scene in the movie where the kid is in church, Jimmy's in church, and the preacher's talking about not giving up and hanging in there and things like that. And so uh, his love interest, Sable, is gone and his best friend's run away. Life is not too good for Jimmy. And he's sitting there by himself and Sable comes back in and sits down. And as the camera pans in on Jimmy, there's a kid sitting behind him that we called up and we said, you know what, we think you represent not giving up quite well. Why don't you come down to Atlanta while we're filming this scene and watch us do it? And when he came down, we said, you know what, why don't we do one better? And we got him a suit and a tie and made him look like he was ready to go to church. And as the camera pans in on the actor, Jimmy, the kid that walked up to us six years ago and said, you need to tell my story. He's sitting right behind him in that scene. And so if you've seen the movie, the real kid is in it. And uh, so there's lots of other things. Pardon? It's inspired by Doug, yes. So the main character is a kid who gets picked on and is kind of overweight, but he goes on a different journey than Doug did. Yes, sir. No, it's an actor. The kid who plays the, the main uh, character, is, he's just an actor. But you know, in that sense, when we were uh, casting for the book, like, well, where'd it go? All right, the, oh, there we go. Okay, the book, when we were doing the book cover, you have to actually have a casting for that too. 
And so we sent out emails all around Atlanta, everything like that. And, uh, and it was, you know, you tell the agencies, like, we need a kid to be on the cover of a book called The Fat Boy Chronicles. You need to be a little bit overweight. Guess how many people showed up or answered that? Like two. And then one of them said, I don't know. Because all the agencies were like, oh, we only have beautiful little kids. We don't have anybody that's overweight. And even the ones that were a little bit, they were like, I don't know if I want to be associated with the word, you know, with fat and all that. This one kid, Christopher Rivera, Christopher Rivera, who is now in New York, uh, said, I'll give it a shot. And so he showed up and we did the, the cover and all of that. And just to show you, talk about editing and all that, guess how many photographs were taken so that it could be whittled down to one? You want to make a guess? A lot, yes. Even more specific. It was about 750 photographs and then we had to go through all of them to get it down to the one that was the cover. And so, but then all of a sudden, while it was kind of crazy, while we were there doing the cover shoot, one of uh, this guy who became the investor for the movie, he said, can I read the manuscript? And we're like, yeah, sure. So he read it and he called and he said, I really like this. I think I want to make it into a movie. And we're like, okay. And so guess who got dibs on trying out for the main character role? That kid, right? The one who said, I'll take a chance and be on the cover of a book, All right? And so one of the lessons from that is get out there and try. I was a math teacher and a coach. If I hadn't tried to write, I wouldn't be here. If Michael Jordan had never picked up a basketball, nobody would know he, how great he is. Whatever it is, any person that you look up to, where they're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing that they can do all that, whether it's painting or playing tennis or whatever it is. If they hadn't tried and failed a little bit, they never would be where they are. So don't be afraid to try. Don't be afraid to try and give it a shot. If it doesn't work out, so be it. Yes? Yeah, we filmed it down in Noonan, Georgia. It was uh, the summer of 09. We came in right after Zombieland filmed, and the mayor was like, you're not gonna leave any arms and legs laying around, are you? And they're like, no. And so uh, it, we, it was about a two month shoot. We had, to, we had to film in the summer because we needed a lot of school scenes. And so, uh, so that was kind of how that worked. But it was fun, it was very hot. A lot of people asked the question, did the real kid, did the kid in the movie lose weight? And so there's some tricks you can do in a movie to make it look like that. And then at the very end, you know, we had to show, in a book, I can just write, Jimmy loses weight, yay for Jimmy. But in a movie, you gotta show it. And so we had to do another trick to make it come out right at the end. I'm not gonna tell you what it is. You wanna know? No, I'm not gonna tell you. I can't tell you. No, you really wanna know? No, I can't. No, you haven't seen it yet. If y'all, when y'all, after you watch it, I'll. I'll come back and tell you to see. I'll do a five minute talk. All right. Oops. He's full of questions. So. <laughs> yes. That's not a question yet. I just want my freedom. Okay. Anybody else? Any of the adults have questions? And, you know, yes, ma'am. I know that our Woo! superintendent, that um, works. Dr. John Barge, has promoted this book. Community. Yes. How did that come about? Uh, wow, well, how did the superintendent of the state get involved? I, having been a teacher, you know, I was just, I kind of called him up one day, not him. I called up the office and I said, hey, I've got this, we've got this project we're working on. Would you like to know about it? Because, uh, you know, by then, the book had already been out and was getting, you know, good response and everything like that. And it was being used around the nation. So um, his chief of staff said, all right, come on down and talk. And we just kind of chatted. And the superintendent watched him and the staff watch the movie and then off we went. And so that was kind of crazy. And uh, so, you know, he's a good fellow. He tries to do right. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. There is a curriculum guide that goes with it. It's online. You can find us. Uh, Sleeping Bear Press is the publisher. If you go to the fatboychronicles.com, uh, there's all kind of resources on there, things to do as a parent, things to do as a teacher, stuff like that, things to do as a kid, you know. But the curriculum guide's on there. There's also one from the city of Charlotte. They, uh, the book there and the movie are part of the curriculum for this 300,000 kid county. And uh, so we're up there a lot talking and stuff like that. So.
So there's there's a lot of good resources out there. Yes. Well, that mic's working just fine. <laughs> The real kid? The real kid or the, or the... Oh my gosh, it's gonna have my ears ringing for two days. Uh, yes, there's some teachers, but in the writing the book and all that, we really didn't want to make the teachers be the heroes, we wanted the kid to be the hero. And so that was kind of the way we took that. Uh, yes, there's wonderful teachers out there that do write, but the fact that there's an issue means that there's maybe some that don't. And so we didn't want the adults to step in and solve Jimmy's problems for him. We wanted him to have to go on that journey. So that was kind of how we did that. Yes, ma'am. Just speak up. <laughs> speak up. <laughs> yes. What did I? What did I think of bully? Yeah. No, I mean, ours is a narrative. It's a story. It's just kind of like, here you are in this kid. It's a year in the life of a ninth grade kid. And the book is his journal for ninth grade English class. And, uh, and in the entries he lets the, t the teacher read, it's just kind of funny high school life. And in the ones he would fold and say, please don't read this, and it's those painful days. And so it can be really funny on two pages and really not so funny on the next one. And, uh, and so there's all kind of stuff. I mean, Jimmy, one of the things that Jimmy does, I mean, the, you know, uh, he, nobody's perfect. Him and Paul, his friend Paul, uh, decide that they're going to uh, try to catch this killer in town, and so they use his sister's picture on a Facebook page. And so, in essence, Jimmy becomes the bully, and he start, and he realizes that later on, that you know we can all we can all be anything we want to, and he kind of slips up, and he kind of ends up being the bully to his sister. But the bullying movie is a documentary that follows four kids' lives. I mean, it's really good and it's emotional. Some of the things that I did not care for was that it doesn't have a lot of resolution. It just kind of tells you their stories and it kind of leaves you hanging about where, where to go. And, uh, and, you know, and, and I know that even though things are, when they're documentaries, they kind of cherry pick what they put on there. And so, but it's, it's good, it's worth watching for sure. And there's a book and a curriculum that goes with that as well. Yes, sir. Man, you're just full of questions. That's good. Well, so it's right. His question is, why do you think people still bully, even though it was made illegal five or six years ago? Well, people still run stop signs, and people still do all kind of things that are illegal. Uh, you cannot legislate how somebody thinks necessarily and the fact that I mean even though bullying and all that all the time it still takes place a lot of it because of what's changed in your life that was not a part of my growing up or maybe even your parents growing up is the influence of uh, the media and the internet and cell phones and all this kind of stuff a lot of uh, kids are bullied uh, let me see, what is that statistic? For a kid who gets bullied by text. No, not cyberbullying. Well, somebody will find out their phone number and send them a text that's mean. Uh, half of that takes place at school. So the kid who is the victim, they can't get away from it. When I was growing up, if somebody said something to me, I got on the bus and went, see you tomorrow. And I didn't have to deal with it. Now, when you get home, it's on the internet. It's, you know, it's, it's everywhere. And, and I think that's one of the things that's changed to where uh, the, those of us that want to do something about bullying are trying to figure out that, that media world and how that has influence. My thing has always been, when people say, oh, I don't think the media and what we see and hear influences us in any way, then my response to that is, I wonder why um, Super Bowl 30-second commercials cost $5 million if they didn't think what you saw was influencing you. And so, anyway, I hope that helps. Yes, sir.
Right. That's great. And he said, I've seen bullying that much. And there's a lot of schools out there that are wonderful, you know. And the fact that I'm, you know, that we're here not be- is not because there's a bullying problem, so there doesn't become one. And, uh, and so I can walk into school and you can tell immediately, it's like, these people have it going on and they are doing something and they're proactive and things are going to be, you know, there might be a little bit of a problem, probably not much, because everybody is on board, right? Students, teachers, adults, the community is involved. And then I'll go in some where I can tell in two minutes where it's like, okay, I am here because they want to be able to put a little check next to the we did something about bullying day. And then when I'm gone, everything's back to the way it was. Or, I mean, it has an effect for, for a while. But until everybody buys in, then things don't change. And so there are a lot of schools that do well. But even in those, there's always somebody, just like the Doug, that never made a peep. I mean, he made A's in school, and he did fine. And he was, you know, always attended school and did great. But, he, you know, there was those times in which people dogged him out. And, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I've had it said to me many a times where, some, where that will come up. And then some other kid, you know, like... In the same school, one kid will go, I don't really think bullying here. And another kid will come up afterwards and say, well, let me tell you how they, what they do to me. And so it can be right there next to you, but you just don't see it. And so, which is, you know, which is good. But always, you know, it's kind of like you don't, you never notice how many white trucks there are until you buy a white truck. And then you go, wow, these things are everywhere. The more you kind of think that, wow, this might be happening, then the more you might actually see it, as opposed to thinking it's not there. Yes, sir. Way back in the back. Right. Yeah, you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it a lot. Woo. He's, uh, he's a very spiritual kid, and his family is. And so he, uh, part of his network was youth group at church. And he had a place to go and people to hang out with that were comforting to him and would help him and he knew that he wouldn't be dogged out there. And so going to church and listening and uh, reading the Bible and all that helped him immensely. Uh, One thing that I know it helped him with after the fact was forgiving. And so, you know, we talked about it some, not like in depth, but we did talk about that. And uh, which is why we left it in the interview. And, it's, and it's, a, it's not a big part of the movie. We wanted it to be not so much that, but it's in there some where you get the point that, you know, there's a lot to be said for where we are. Yes, ma'am. Right. Well, it's funny. Sometimes, I mean, I've seen kids that are the smallest one in a class, and they have the mindset that you're not going to do that when I'm around and you're not going to do that to me and everybody kind of gets it you know and so but I would for the kid who thinks that wow if all of a sudden I say something it's going to be turned on me then recruit some folks don't just sit there and say okay I'm going to be the I'm going to I want you to take all that bullying and dump it on me and sometimes they do they're like because it doesn't bother me at all there's nothing you can say right but for that kid They've got to try. And then if that doesn't work, then they can go talk to somebody. The one thing that I really try to emphasize is to don't think that you have to solve all these problems by yourself. You can talk to another. If that day they dog you out, then talk to some of your other friends. You know, at some point, you've got to have the tipping point where you're, what you say and what you do wins. And if you always think that, wow, no matter what I do, we're always going to lose this battle, then you've lost it before you start it. And, uh, I mean, and it's not easy. I mean, I get it, you know. I mean, I was there, and I saw it in school and all that, and kids will say, well, I don't want to say anything, because then they start dogging me out. And, uh, but if that's the attitude we have, this will never get solved. 
And so the one thing, if a kid says, thinks that it's going to make it worse for them, then they can go talk to a, a teacher, they can go talk to somebody, or they can talk to that kid and say, hey, you know what, we're leaving. Let's get up and go sit over there. I'm not, you know, the, a lot of times what happens is that why the kid is sitting with a group that's dogging somebody out anyway is because they're kind of part of that group, even if it's on the fringe. You know, you kind of sit with your buddies. And if I saw my friends doing something, I'm not really sure if I would consider them my friends much anymore. I mean, it's very difficult and it's on an individual basis. But, I mean, at the very least, go talk to the counselor and say, you know, what do you think I should do? You know, I mean, that's, that's kind of a, that's not a concrete example or answer of what to do because every, the kid who's going to be the one to speak up has to be strong enough to do it sometimes. And, you know, and that's, that's the hard part because the thing is, if they're not strong enough to kind of do that, then the chances are they're going to get picked on anyway. The people are, the bullies will sniff them out that they're not going to speak up for themselves. If you can't speak up for somebody else, then certainly you can't speak up for yourself. So, I don't know. Yes, ma'am. Say that last part again. Do you want to address some of these? Right. Oh, I believe it. How to protect them from a school that does nothing? Well, taking them out might be pretty good. I mean, you don't want to always remove your kid from a situation that's uncomfortable. That's not always the best thing. But at the same time, that's kind of what you have to do sometimes. You know, if a school, which is, you send your kid off to school for seven or eight hours a day saying, take care of them, make them safe and make them feel wanted, and they don't, then, you know, I mean, it's, what can you do to change that situation? If you've got a school that's being bullheaded about things, and you've got administrators that kind of go, eh, you know, it's not that bad, she brought it on herself, blah, 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 all the excuses, then, uh, then it's time to speak up for your kid and let other people know. And I would let other parents know. It's like, hey, this is what's going on around here. If, when it's your kid, because as soon as your kid's removed from the situation, guess what? Somebody else is the target. So when it's your kid all of a sudden, what are you going to do? You know, and that's when the parents kind of have to band together and kind of demand things. Schools, I know, because I was in them long enough, if, when parents start to really speak up, and start talking to somebody other than just in the school, whether it's the media or whatever, schools will listen and they get all worked up about it. And things change. I mean, I know a school in Fulton County where the principal was allowing bullying to take place and the parents spoke up and she is no longer there. And so there's things, it might not fix the problem right then. The chances are that's never gonna happen. No, because you, you can't just take a kid and go, I'm going to flip the switch on you who's been bullying my kid forever, and you all of a sudden not. You know, that's not going to take the place. Then they just get better at finding those places where they can pick on them and not be seen. And uh, so, but what you did, I mean, I think, you know, is, is a good thing. But I wouldn't leave the other kids behind just to suffer like yours did. I would still be talking to somebody over at that school or in the media or whatever or other parents and say, this is going on, and this is why we left. Are you okay with it? You know, do you want to talk about this one? Um, actually, we need to close. Oh, my fault. You're okay. Um, my fault will probably be here for a few minutes yeah. at the end of the program. Um, but we do need to close with prayer. And first person to raise your hand and tell me who our speaker was. Who was it? You got to open these. Mike, good. Here's the poster that Mike signed, and it says, be a hero. So you are now challenged to yep. be a hero. Good thing it's in there. Um, the reason that we had... Well, hey. You could have said it. You were slow. You were just a slow. So we'll do a few famous and Wednesday. Let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, 